Bill Winters, how are emerging markets doing? <laughs> yeah, emerging markets are okay. You, you, you can't believe everything you see on Bloomberg. Uh, now, th now that is not true. <laughs> <laughs> you must pay attention to everything you see on Bloomberg. Uh, no, emerging markets are okay. Right? The, the, uh, the, there's a fascinating dichotomy from, from my perspective right now between the business on the ground and the sentiment. Uh, and obviously we can look forward and see all sorts of challenges in emerging markets, no doubt we're gonna talk about that. Uh, but business is getting on with business. And, uh, and trade is getting on with trade, and it's, uh, it's okay. But, but sentiment is trending because of trade. So are, are you seeing on the ground emerging markets uh, chief executives investing even less than in Western markets? Uh, I say that there's a, there's a hesitation in, uh, in a number of regards. So on, on the one hand, uh, the idea that, that somehow supply chains are going to reconfigure. Of course, they've been reconfiguring for a while anyway. China has, has upgraded in its... Uh, the quality of its, its product and, uh, and lower uh, intensity and lower cost manufacturing is, has been going elsewhere for some time. Um, and uh, that's uh, probably on the margin accelerating on the, on the back of trade tensions. So that's, that's a clear change, but it's a, but it's a change in, in volume, not a change in direction. Uh, the, the bigger change is, is the, uh, the, the concerns about unreliability of supply chain uh, that we see in, uh, in and around the U.S.-China uh, conflict, call it, because it goes beyond trade into, into security issues, and obviously the, the, the 5G Huawei is, is, is one key example of that. Uh, and that's a, that's a little bit more enduring and a little bit more of a change. Uh, there are winners and losers in that. Uh, Chinese companies themselves are repotting uh, parts of their supply chain from China to other parts of, of Asia. Uh, you know, Taiwan has been, a, been a, an, a beneficiary of that. Vietnam has been a beneficiary. Uh, and, but there are some losers as well. I mean, there are clearly some industries in China that are, that are feeling a pinch, and uh, the Chinese are appropriately responding in terms of, of uh, some offsetting stimulus. Uh, there's uh, goods that are being, that are being taxed uh, in the U.S. or prospectively tach, uh, taxed in the U.S. are uh, finding their way into other markets in Asia. So uh, uh, there's a, a, a relative flooding mm -hmm. of uh, some low-end products into markets like Indonesia. Uh, so you know, th th there are winners and losers in this, but you know, overall, the, uh, the, the people are adapting to, uh, to a different world. H how has it changed? So we have a great Bloomberg chart, actually, which you can see uh, just above me, which basically looks at the recent slide in the emerging markets. So MSCI index still outperforming. We did normalize it, but still outperforming the SPX since the financial crisis. A lot of people are very familiar with what yeah. Standard Charter does. Yeah. But actually, where are you most bullish? What countries are you investing in, in emerging markets, and the ones that where you're retrenching a bit? So just, just re really, really simply, our business is half-half retail and wholesale. Uh, the retail is all in... I think what we're calling emerging markets, but recognizing that our biggest markets are, are Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, Korea, which are not emerging markets by, by any definition other than the fact that they used to be emerging markets. But they're fully developed uh, markets at this point. Uh, and the wholesale business is truly global, with about a third of our, of our client activity coming from Europe and the Americas, uh, with the rest coming in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. So the, uh, but in that, in that particular definition of emerging markets, which is Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, we'll call it that, and we'll, we'll leave out uh, Latin America and and Central and Eastern Europe, uh, from our perspective, only because we, we have a business there, but, we're, but no, nowhere near as big in, in the rest of the world. And emerging markets are in great shape. Uh, they, uh, certainly, the, 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 the bigger problems in emerging markets have been a few of the bigger countries. Uh, Russia, uh, South Africa, Brazil are, are, are the ones that, that stand out. Uh, that have tended to drag down indices like this, which nevertheless have been, have been pretty strong performers, if I'm reading that particular chart the right way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when you, when you take out some of the, the, the bigger, m more problematic markets, uh, the, the, clearly the bulk of the world's growth is coming from emerging markets, and it most clearly is coming from China and the, and the China sphere. Uh, and there's, it's hard to see in, in any configuration of, of outcomes to the, the current tensions that that changes. Right? That the bulk of the world's growth is going to come from that part of the world for the foreseeable future. But are emerging markets disproportionately affected by the trade war? Uh, it's too, tr it's too early to tell. Uh, I mean, so far, nobody's been particularly affected by the trade war. We've seen that China has a bigger, a bigger trade surplus with the U.S. now than it did when the trade war started. So you know, China has accommodated. U.S. In manufacturing has accommodated. Uh, th there's been some benefit in terms of investment in the rest of the region. And, uh, and, and there, will, there will be some losers, as, as, as we discussed before. But no, I don't think emerging markets will be disproportionately affected. I think if the world, uh, if globalization goes into reverse, uh, if we see a structural decrease in the level of trade uh, as, a, as a proportion of GDP, mm -hmm. uh, then emerging markets will be disproportionately influenced because you, you've got big economies like the U.S. that are not very dependent on trade. So you, you, you won't have a huge GDP impact if trade goes to zero. Of course, it won't, but, 
but if there was a material decrease, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, it would be relatively little impact in the medium term on the U.S. Um, but by the same token, China, and it, given that it was an export-driven economy as recently as 10 years ago, it's not anymore, right? The, the bulk of the economic activity in China is goods and services in China. Right? It's, it's a domestic market. Uh, but there's still you know, something like 14% of, of GDP is contributed through, uh, through external trade. And uh, obviously, if that's materially impacted, then that, that takes the wind out of a 6% growth kind of sale. But you're still talking 6% growth. You know, maybe 6 goes to 5.5 uh, or 5.25. Uh, I think most politicians in the West would be delighted with a five and a half or, or five and a quarter percent growth. Okay, so on that, uh, we'll go to a poll amongst the emerging markets, and, and Bill was pretty clear in, in what they're focusing on. This is a poll amongst the emerging markets. I see the most opportunity in, then it's multiple choice, China and Asia, B, Latin America, Eastern Europe as a C, and Africa as a D. So whilst you're voting, and I'll ask the impossible question to Bill Winters, which is how does the trade war end? Is it here to stay for the next 10 years? So I, I think it's important that I'm watching this real time, liking the answers. <laughs> uh, the, uh, we have to bifurcate the, the, uh, the trade war from the, from the security challenges or the security concerns. Uh, but aren't they one? Well, they've, they've been conflated. And I think as, as we see a resolution to at least this chapter of the trade war uh, between the US and China, uh, you'll see some conflation. I, I, I imagine uh, that it'll be some sort of a you know, soybeans for Huawei exchange. Whoever thought we'd be talking about that, but you know, we're, we're living in unusual times. The, uh, uh, the, the, the trade disputes can be settled. I think it's in China's interest, it's in the US's interest. You know, Europe and the rest of Asia are very keen to contribute to a resolution to a trade dispute because it's, it's, everyone recognizes it's in no one's interest for this to extend for a long period of time. So I, I believe that there's an accommodation there. And I think the, the, the framework of a deal is, is, is available, and I'm, I'm sure that, that it's being discussed in Washington this week. The, uh, the security issues I'm concerned will not go away, uh, but possibly not in, in our lifetimes. Uh, and there's obviously the, the, there's a view that there's some sort of a, of a broader existential struggle that's going on either between systems or between countries. And, uh, and I think uh, we, we can assume that that tension will be there consistently. Now, does it need to be very disruptive? No, it doesn't need to be very disruptive. You can, you can have some constructive competition between, between countries uh, without a complete cessation of, of, of technology exchange. Uh, but we can see that it could be more disruptive than that. And, and it's hard to see how that one rolls back. But do you worry that financial firms can be taken as a pawn in, in this standoff between the US and China? Well, uh, uh, yes. Uh, but I mean, so, I mean, what is the role of a, of a financial system as it relates to law enforcement? I mean, in many ways, we are the, the front line in the fight against financial crime. I mean, Standard Chartered, I think we've learned that the hard way, uh, as, as have lots of other banks, uh, in terms of uh, the, the obligation to do obvious things like take steps to prevent money laundering related to human trafficking or international wildlife trafficking. That's obvious, and we're all, we're all on top of that, and, and we believe that. And it gets a little bit more difficult when you get into sanctions because one person's sanctions is another person's persecution. And, uh, but we know very clearly what our, what our role is. Uh, if we want to operate in the U.S., we comply with the U.S. sanctions regime. If we want to operate in China, we comply with the China sanctions regime, and we comply with the, sanction, the, the China uh, bank uh, data privacy regime, which is very clear. And the, the approach that we take in, in this is to say, we're going to be perfectly transparent with everybody about what our obligations are. And if you, don't, if you feel that you can't, or you don't want to, or you won't deal with us on that basis, that's fine. Because if you don't think you can comply with our regime, then we probably can't deal with you anyway. And uh, I think by, by being, uh, completely true to the law of each of the countries where we operate. We can, maybe we, we're still a pawn somehow, but it feels like we can avoid the, the worst of the, of the challenge. W what about the Hong Kong protests? I mean, that, that has a huge impact for a bank that's you know, quite reliant on Hong Kong. Yeah, no, no, Hong Kong is our, it's our biggest single market. Uh, we're very, very keen for the, the, the issues which are on the table to be resolved peacefully. Uh, and, uh, and we have every hope that that, that will happen. But if, you, if you're watching things evolve week to week, uh, there clearly has been a, an escalation in the violence. Uh, I think the, the leadership in Hong Kong is in, is in a terribly difficult position. Uh, and they're, they're just going to have to work through it in a, in a, in a steady way that, that addresses not just the, the issue of violence today, but also the social issues uh, uh, that, that perhaps are at the root of, of a lot of the frustration um, amongst the, the demonstrators, not just the violent ones, but, but the rest. If Hong Kong as a financial hub loses out, would it lose out to another city in Asia? I think Hong Kong is very resilient. I mean, when you think about what, what Hong Kong has been through over the past 
uh, well, a couple of hundred years, but, but you know, whether it's SARS or Asian financial crisis, uh, the, the financial crisis, Hong Kong is, has regularly and routinely found a way to bounce back in good shape. And I, and I have no doubt that Hong Kong can, can bounce back this way. I think Hong Kong, uh, apart from being a great city uh, and a semi-autonomous region and, and, and a great uh, uh, place to do business, it is a gateway to China. And, and, it, and, it, and China clearly has an interest in maintaining that gateway uh, and has reaffirmed their commitment to, uh, to one party, two systems, uh, which the leadership in Hong Kong has subscribed to as well. So I, I think there's a way through this. It's going to be very difficult. Uh, you know, some industry sectors in, in, in Hong Kong have really been hit hard. I mean, tourism and retail, uh, really dramatic falls uh, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, and clearly it's going to impact economic activity, which, uh, which will then flow through to, uh, to the, the wealth of people on the street. But, uh, but, but I, I think this is, this is recoverable for Hong Kong, and Hong Kong will, will return to being a great global city. Um, so how much more revenue will you do in Asia and China in the next 10 years? And what kind of products? Is it digital? Is it focusing on wealthy clients that you want, you know, what do you want to do there? Yeah, so about, about, as I mentioned before, about half our business is retail. It's a little bit skewed to, uh, to affluent customers on, on, the, on the individual side, so wealth management products and things like that. Uh, that's been growing very, very steadily. We've been doing sort of 10% plus uh, compound growth for years. Uh, we've been investing heavily there, so we would expect that to accelerate. Uh, Hong Kong is the biggest single market. Uh, that's going to slow down a bit in the short term, uh, but the rest of the region is still growing very fast. So uh, that, that, that business remains strong. And we're a global network bank. So we deal with multinational corporations wherever they happen to be based, uh, uh, bringing to them our core anchor position in, in Asia, in the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, the bulk of the activity is in Asia. That's, that's it's, uh, about two-thirds mm -hmm. uh, of, our, uh, of our overall activity. And uh, and it's, you know, you've got strong economic growth. You've got strong desire from the West and the East to invest into that region. Uh, that investment needs to be financed. That trade needs to be financed. Those, that cash needs to be managed. That, that uh, currency risk needs to be, uh, needs to be hedged. And this, this is, these are the things we focused on. And I must say, it's going very well. But how much of a headache is a strong dollar for emerging markets? Uh, the, the strong dollar... Uh, in and of itself isn't a problem. Uh, it's the change in the, in the dollar that, that becomes a problem. Now, on, on the one hand, volatility is good for our, for our trading businesses. Uh, we've had a very a particularly good run in our, in our financial markets business over the past year and a half or so, um, not just because the dollar is strong, but because the, the paradigms are, are shifting. The, uh, uh, clearly, a, a, a shock to a strong dollar uh, undermines the, uh, the effectiveness of monetary policy in, in the countries in which we operate. So, uh, weaker currencies call for, for rising interest rates at a time when the global trend is towards lower interest rates. And uh, that puts central banks across the regions where we operate under a fair amount of pressure. Whether they're pegged, like Hong Kong or much of the Middle East, or unpegged, you can feel the, the, the prospect of, of some pressure. Uh, but I think central banks are extremely well prepared. I mean, Hong Kong, obviously, I would say, extraordinarily well prepared in, in the case, in, in the sense that they've got FX reserves that are, uh, that are multiples of, of any call on, on those stocks that might exist. So, there's really no question about the peg in Hong Kong. Uh, but in other markets, uh, it's, it's tough to balance the strong dollar with your monetary policy, with your domestic economic situation, as you go into a, a slow economic period. But it, are you more bullish on countries where they can actually do a lot more fiscal spending than others? How do you look at the debt ratio? Well, I think we look at the world right now, and, and you, you can imagine, certainly in the developed world, that we're, we're either at or reaching the end of, of the effectiveness of highly stimulated monetary policy. And fiscal policy is, is, is the only alternative that, that's left for, for governments to pull. I mean, if we talk about structural reform, but that tends to take a little bit more time. Uh, the emerging markets have, have more, more room to run because they, they're starting with higher interest rates. Uh, the disinflation trend is less well established, although the, the trends are consistent uh, across our markets. And, uh, and I, th I think the, the, uh, the challenge for governments is to maintain confidence in, in their respective economies uh, while easing up on the on the the fiscal constraints a bit, uh, without going overboard, uh, the, the countries that have that have, have gone overboard uh, have been called out by markets pretty quickly. Um, I have a question from the floor, which is: Can you share any analysis of emerging market consumer trends? Yeah, I mean the one market that, that clearly is, has taken a beating is Hong Kong. Uh, we, we've seen that that obviously we talked about the retail sales figures in Hong Kong, and the bulk of that is from a lack of tourists rather than lack of domestic okay. spending. But nevertheless, uh, consumer spending is down. Uh, in the rest of Asia, consumer spending has remained pretty robust. And you, you could look at consumer credit and say uh, we're at the, at the high end of, of the cyclical trend. Uh, so I think that there's a limit to the degree to which the consumer can drive the next phase of growth in, uh, across Asia, the Middle East and Africa. Uh, but, uh, but consumer activity has remained relatively robust and I think, I think will do for some time.
Okay, if you were to pick a country and actually say I'll be you know, fully invested and I'll, I'll design a new platform either digitally or a new product sustainably, wh what is the, um, you know, a country which you could look at the rest of Asia through to kind of give you the, the main trends? Uh, that's a good question because I mean, Asia has become quite eclectic. And when we look at the, at the, the big markets, uh, Indonesia is probably the one that you would say is closest to the center of gravity. Yeah. One, it's big. Uh, it's growing at a healthy pace, but they've got some, some, some reasonable structural challenges as well. Uh, stable politics, which is, which is incredibly important, especially in that country, but, but in that part of the world. Uh, currency that's that, that stabilized, some fiscal room, but you know, it, it's still, uh, as a country, moderately exposed to commodity cycles, and the commodity cycle is, is feeling like, like a, a bit heavy right now. And, uh, and they've got plenty of domestic uh, political challenges and social challenges as well. So, uh, but we look at, at Indonesia, we see a country that's growing below its potential, but still growing healthily. Uh, we see a country that's oriented to opening up rather than to, to closing in. Uh, we see a financial sector that's becoming increasingly strong rather than weak, which is obviously good for, for stimulating and, and transmitting the various policy uh, impetus that comes. And, uh, yeah, and it's an important market for us. What about sustainability? Are investors in Asia as interested or, or even more interested in sustainability than They're getting ones there. here? They're getting there. They're, I mean, nowhere near as, as, as committed as, as I would say uh, as, uh, as large European or, uh, or US investors are, but, uh, but, it, but they're aware and, and we're seeing you know, the kind of backlash against you know, the, the, the haze that smokes, the, the, that flows over to Singapore uh, that's coming from, from burning crops in, in Indonesia for the most part. Uh, we're seeing a, a much more determined pushback within Indonesia to, to reconcile that, but it's still there, right? And you, you, you don't get a haze coming in you know, from, from France into, into the UK anymore. Um, we'll wait until November 1st and see what, what floats our way. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, but, but it still happens in, in, in Asia. But, it, but it's, I say there, there's a focus. It's not being driven by the, by the investors, though. It's, it's being driven primarily by the populations. Um, another question from the floor. Which African countries do you feel can finally move forward and become attractive for investors? So I, I would love to think that Nigeria could round the bend. I think they've got to, they've got to engage in another round of, of, well, a round of structural reforms, including uh, reforms to, uh, to their monetary policy. Uh, and I think that, that, is, that, that the reform agenda is significantly holding back growth in Nigeria. But I look at their neighbor in Ghana, uh, which was, you know, was up on the ropes two years ago, three years ago, went through an IMF program, uh, really got their act together both fiscally and monetarily, and is back to the races. Is, is growing at a good healthy rate, good external investment, Obviously, it's a smaller country than Ghana, uh, but I'm, I'm very encouraged. I'm very encouraged by what's happening in Kenya. Um, Kenya also had a, had a difficult time, more political than, than economic, uh, obviously compounded by security concerns, but Kenya is, is, is right back on track. Um, and I, if we're picking a, you know, a, a challenged one against each positive one, let's say, you know, Zambia is really having a tough time yep. right now. And Zambia feels like they are where, Gambia, or where Ghana was uh, four years ago. Tough actions that you have to take to get that right. So, uh, you, but but the, each of these countries has, has an underlying dynamism and, and a demographic dividend that gives them the opportunity to move forward at a healthy pace. They, they've just got to get the, the, uh, the economic and political package right. I mean, it, it'd be difficult, of course, to grow if there was a global downturn. When do you see a recession coming? There, I mean, there's still clear exposure in Africa to the, to the commodity cycle, uh, although I think many of these countries have done a better job of diversifying a bit. Uh, I, I'm pretty hopeful about the global economy. We, we see all the sources of, of, of compression. And, uh, and we see that central banks are having a hard time using monetary policy to, to, to get things going again. Uh, but there is some fiscal room, and, uh, and you know, corporate balance sheets are pretty strong. Uh, and there's a, a massive sentiment drag that's coming from the geopolitical conflicts that we are all preoccupied with, whether it's Brexit or war in the Middle East or US-China tensions or, uh, or uh, the, the goings on in Hong Kong. So I, I think we're... I think we underestimate the impact on, on economic activity and, and confidence that comes from this range of things, uh, and, but we're still growing. So I imagine we'll have a, a period of, of slower growth that will probably go for another uh, uh, six or 12, maybe 18 months, uh, with then a gradual return to a, a little bit more normal, you know, closer to potential level of global, global growth. Um, is the latest round of easing from central banks doing more harm than good? I don't know about harm, uh, but I, I question how much good it's doing. I, I, I think the... Uh, the efficacy of, of a single monetary bullet is, is, is quite low right now. And uh, uh, you know, I certainly see in, in Europe, in the Eurozone in particular, the damage that it's doing to the banking system. And we're, we're, we're relatively immune to that, but not completely. Uh, and it's, uh, and I, but obviously we're, we're, we're looking at a, a, at a US rate environment that's moving closer 
to, uh, to a European type environment. And it's, it's very bad for the financial system. It's very bad for banks. Uh, and that's, a, that's the kind of thing uh, that, that just clogs up the transmission mechanism for some of the good things that could be coming down the road. So I think there's plenty to be worried about. Uh, but, but I also s I, I see a way through it that's not catastrophic. All right, Bill Winters, thank you so much for the thank conversation. You.